extremely excited to have this iconic BMW M3 behind me right now. See, Trav and I have been buying, fixing, and selling enthusiast cars for a couple of years now, but the way that we got this one was really unorthodox. We're car nuts, and we love going to car shows, and that's allowed us to meet a lot of very cool people. Now, one of our buddies called me when we were coming back from a car show a couple weeks ago and said that his friend's friend had some sort of newer generation M3 that he needed to sell because he was moving. Trav and I had talked about buying an E92 M3 about a year or two ago, and instead we got a comp package M3. So, gotta be curious and check it out, right? Wow. Hey, thanks for making the time again. Of course, of course. Yeah. You like the car? I do, and I've been looking for one. Um, could you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, I got it for my dad uh, about a year ago. He, okay. he bought it new in 2008, and, okay. um, and then bought another new one last year, Okay. and just gave it to me. Awesome. Wow, he just yeah. gave it to you? Whoa, whoa, whoa. He gave it to you? You might want to sign up your dad for dad of the year because this is such a nice gift. The hardest thing for me is instantly my brain is just going, how do I negotiate with this? The guy was given a $30,000 car. Ooh, the iconic quad tips on the M3. And this rear end is awesome. And at first glance, this car was pretty amazing. But BMWs are known as the ultimate driving machine. And so, had to get it out on the road and see if it would live up to the hype. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a car that everybody should drive at least once in their lifetime. This is the second E90 M3 that I've driven, and the first one was a complete turd. But there's something very special about this car when you look at the M badge on the steering wheel, on the tachometer, and on the shift knob. It hints that this thing is very unique. Most likely the first and last M car with this monster V8. The M division started 30 years ago with a Revy four cylinder in the S14, and the power band of this S65 V8 has the same characteristics. This engine is not just special, it's motorsport special. So this is definitely a great road car, but there are still some issues with it. There's a whine coming from the rear. This transmission is a little bit more notchy than previous M cars that we've owned. And there's a crack in the windshield, which is BMW OEM glass, so it cannot be cheap to replace. So the million dollar question, do you buy this car? Yes. Yes, yes, you buy this car. The E90 M3 is an instant classic. It's the perfect blend of muscle car and sports car, and it is versatile enough with the four doors that you can have it on the weekend for a weekend getaway, car show, and also daily drive it to work. This car needs some tender loving care with the check engine light, front tires, and a few other small things, but it is definitely worth the effort to bring this thing back up to the condition it should have been in. And it does not get much better than this. Wow. Wow. This thing is an incredible machine. Of course the car had some faults. So when I got back from the test drive, I went over the car with a fine tooth comb because I knew whatever I didn't catch, Trav wouldn't be happy. Henry David Thoreau was an American essayist, poet, philosopher, abolitionist, naturalist, tax resistor, development critic, surveyor, and a historian once said that the price of anything is the amount of life you're willing to exchange for it. Jordan doesn't really have much skin in the game because he was given this car. And so I tried to use time to my advantage. Since Jordan hadn't publicly listed the car yet, he asked me what I thought the car was worth. I lowballed him just a little bit because I knew that I could come up, but I couldn't come back down. So I'm taking a huge risk by not taking this to the shop and uh, doing an inspection. Um, I'd be able to give you 22.5 cash for it today. And then you don't have to waste your time with anybody else. You can go wine tasting or do whatever you'd like to do this afternoon instead. 
I could tell by his body language that a light bulb went off in his head when I talked about wasting more time with other potential buyers. But that said, he still countered me. Can't do 23. How about 22,750? Does that work? Mm. All right, 22,750. Awesome. It's going to a good home. As they say, it takes two to tango. So I met him in the middle and we sealed the deal. Yes, this BMW M3 has some issues. So next logical step was to take it to Trav and see if he thought we could turn it into an ideal car. An E90 sedan. I know, I know. In Silverstone. Right? With six speed manual. Six gears, baby. How's it drive? Ah, okay. There was a whine from the rear end okay. somewhere at different RPMs. I don't think it's a big deal. And I know that you got the magical hands to be able to fix that. Also, the gearbox was kind of notchy. Like, it didn't really want to go into second or third gear that easily, especially when cold. Could just be old fluid. That's why I have you. And uh, also, a check engine light came on while I was test driving the car, but I'm sure it wasn't a big deal. I turned the car off, turned it back on, and it was the okay. It's not a big deal. Bring it back to the shop. It'll be fine. Why'd you buy an M3 with the check engine light on? You didn't even scan it for faults? Oh, come on. You know you like it. I've been flogging this thing trying to get the check <laughs> engine light to come back on. It's hard to do. Well, you know what? Well, it doesn't really matter now. Why don't we get this thing washed up? We'll get it back in the garage and let's get it diagnosed. Are you washing? When doing an inspection on one of these cars before you buy it, there's really not much else to look for that you don't already look for on a regular 3 Series. For starters, let's have a look around the engine bay. Remove the upper portion of the airbox and thoroughly inspect the engine air filter. Check for any damage or tears on the filter's substrate and look for excessive debris. Next, we'll check the cabin filters. To do so, remove the cabin filter panel and similar to the engine air filters, look for any damage or excessive dirt buildup. Next, inspect the brake fluid. Brake fluid should be a clearish yellow and the reservoir should be full unless the brake pads are warm. Check for excessive moisture buildup under the oil filler cap. This buildup could mean a problem with the PCV system or even worse, coolant contamination. Have a quick look around and inspect for any oil leaks from the valve covers, vanos solenoids, power steering fluid reservoir, or if applicable, automatic transmission lines. For this next step, you'll need to get the vehicle off the ground. If you don't have access to a lift, I recommend taking it in for an actual PPI. Check the suspension for looseness or damage, and make sure the wheels aren't bent. Take a close look at the tires, check the brake hoses for any cracks or splits, and take a close look at all the ball joints and bushings in the suspension. Take a second look at the engine from underneath because sometimes oil leaks can be hard to see from up top. Look for any leaks around the transmission and inspect the flex disc or the guibo for any cracks or splits. Check the parking brake lines for any signs of fraying or damage and inspect the exhaust as well. Look for any loose hangers or excessive rust. Next, check the body. Look down the sides for any dings or dents and look very closely at the rear for signs of being in a rear end collision. The car needs some work, but it's definitely nothing major. Nothing we can't handle and nothing that we can't do to turn this into an ideal car. I suspect if there's going to be anything that breaks the budget on this car, it's going to be this check engine light. So we're going to start there. Before we can properly diagnose this check engine light, we're going to need to see what faults are stored in the computer. Now in most cases, a simple code reader will do the trick. But having a fully functional scan tool will make sure you're getting the full story and you're able to read manufacturer specific codes. Our BMW is throwing a fault for the bank 2 throttle valve actuator. Each cylinder bank has its own throttle control valve actuator. It's imperative these actuators open and close in perfect harmony. If they don't, the car doesn't have reliable data on what the throttle's doing and it goes into limp mode. Based off the data we just saw on our scan tool, 
the bank two throttle valve actuator is going to need to be replaced. Well, here she is, huh? Oh, legendary S65. Yes, I love it. Fred, this guy live in a jungle? Oh my gosh, come on, I take what I can get. <laughs> Step one to accessing these throttle valve actuators is to remove this intake plenum. I can do that for you. Removing the intake plenum isn't actually all that difficult of a job, but it can be a little bit tricky if you've never done it before. Before the plenum can come off, we need to disconnect everything that's attached to it. So start with the upper air box, followed by the inlet tube, and then the lower air box as well. This car has individual throttle bodies. Each throttle body has a hose clamp that attaches it to this plenum piece. The most difficult part about this entire job is gaining access to each one of those clamps. Before moving forward with taking the plenum off, take a couple seconds and familiarize yourself with all the electrical connectors, vacuum lines, and hose clamps that you're going to need to remove. Also, if you haven't done so already, take the lower portion of the airbox out as well to give yourself just that extra bit of room. The back two cylinders on each bank are the two trickiest to get to. So if you've got a tool like this, a small swivel socket, it'll make your life so much easier. Double check and make sure all eight hose clamps for the throttle bodies are loose and all the electrical connectors are unplugged. Then simply pull up firmly on the plenum and it'll come free. Hey Brad. Trav. Look at those eight individual throttle bodies, man. Yeah, they're they're pretty, huh? Oh my it's gosh. It's like she, isn't it? Oh, beautiful. So, they are beautiful, but they're not working like they should. The trouble is, these four aren't opening quite as quick as these four. Got it, okay. So Am I, I able to tell? I'm gonna jump in the car, we can, we can find out. Okay. See if you can see it. Chances are not. Well, let's see, because I have a pretty quick eye. I right. bought this car after all, <laughs> with the check engine light on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. Wow. You know, they look like they're opening like at the exact same time, man. Well, according to the scan tool, they aren't. Our scan tool is quicker than me. <laughs> Even though we have these little rubber stops that prevent the clamps, or at least they're supposed to prevent the clamps from spinning around too far, it doesn't always work that way. So if you don't snug these all up just a bit before you put the plenum back on, you run the risk of getting seven of them where they need to be, and the eighth one overclocked to where you can't tighten it. I then can't... you back to square one, doing this all again. I was about to ask for your help, I couldn't get it on. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like my problem. Snug up the hose clamps and remove the four or five electrical connectors on the front of the engine that keep the harness junction from moving freely. Now we don't need to remove the harness junction from the engine, we just need to be able to get it up and out of the way. Now before we go any further with the dissection of the top end of this engine, it's a good idea to go ahead and cover up the throttle bodies to make sure you don't drop any foreign contaminants. Foreign contaminants, fasteners, and tools as well. Dropping anything into this engine is definitely going to affect our bottom line. Okay, so we got to get that out now. So we've got to get this out. Come on, Trav. So my game plan, now that we've got all this loose, is to prop this up with something. Maybe yeah. a hood prop see if we can't sneak it out of there. So we're gonna pop this rod off, Okay. take these three fasteners out, and we'll be there. The linkage for the actuator pops off with these. And just three fasteners later, well, here she is. Now basically what goes wrong inside of this is this bit here is the motor, and this bit here is the gear set that actually drives the rod that opens the throttle plates. 
what happens is there are plastic gears between the motor and the driven side that wear out and cause slop. So when the motor moves X amount of degrees to open the throttle plates, the end result isn't quite the same because of the slop, which creates the fault, which puts the car into limp mode, which makes our Brad unhappy. They do actually make a kit to repair the plastic gears inside of this, but because the car has 90,000 miles on it, we've opted just to replace the whole unit. Take care when installing the new actuator. It is a rather fragile component. The control rod for the butterflies snaps right back onto the ball studs easily, and with just three more bolts, our new actuator is installed. Little tip I have to make this actually kind of complicated job a little bit easier, or for the bolts like this, that are really kind of a pain to get started, what you can do is either take a little piece of shop rag like this, or a piece of plastic that the new part came in, just simply rip it off, place it over the socket, take the bolt, shove the two together, Now your bolt started, you can simply move the tool, dip a little bit of plastic so it doesn't start burning and stink, and those hard to access bolts are back where they belong. From this point forward, installation really is the exact opposite of removal. Don't forget to plug in all your electrical connectors, make sure you get everything bolted back down properly, and do not forget to remove the shop regs you use to protect the engine. Make sure the plenum is fully seated before you tighten any of the hose clamps. Reinstall the airbox, clear the faults, and take it for a drive. Not so fast. Before we could take the M on a test drive, we needed new tires. So... I shopped these tires really hard and got a great deal on Michelin's top tier tire. So here's a quick 30 second edit to show you the process of installing tires. With this project, I'm going to be tackling the brake calipers. I'm going to paint them black. But before we get started, let's check out and see what the fine people over at G2 sent us for product. Ooh. 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 All right, we got some non chlorinated brake cleaner. We have. Ooh, reactor for the brake calipers for the paint system. And then we have, well, that looks like the paint. Ooh, and we got an envelope. Ooh, paintbrush, mix stick. Ooh, some swag. Nice. Let's put that on the car. This is going to look good. What I really like about G2 paint is the fact that you brush on the paint rather than spray it on. So there's no need to mask. It's really easy to do. It's a glossy finish and it goes on pretty thick. And so once it does dry, when you're washing the wheels, it actually won't keep the brake dust on the, the calipers that much either. So this is by far the best product that I've found that works on BMWs and any higher performance car. First things first, make sure the sticker's there. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna jack up the car just enough so it alleviates some of the weight on the suspension, but the wheel still does not turn. Now we're gonna take off all the bolts, leave one in. So now we're gonna jack up the car enough so that the tire is not in contact with the pavement. At that point, we can pull the last bolt and the wheel will come off and we'll have access to the caliper. <laughs> And then we're going to liberally squirt as much of this brake cleaner as we can on this thing to get it nice and clean.
and then use a towel and dry it off. These are easily some of the biggest brake calipers I have ever seen. So hopefully we have enough paint to hit all four. At this point, we're gonna mix this potion with this paint and let it sit for five minutes. Once it's sat, we then can apply our first coat to the caliper. So it has come time to paint. Make sure that you don't get the paint on the actual brake pads that sit in here. Other than that, there's not much that can go wrong. Don't be paranoid, just be careful. So now you have to wait about two hours to let the calipers dry. In the meantime, you have a great opportunity to wash the inside of your alloys. They are extremely dirty, and so when you put these back on, everything's gonna look pristine. It's been about an hour now, so I'm gonna put the wheel back on. Won't hurt anything, but I give it about two hours before you actually drive the car. I'd say that's a huge improvement. We bought this car with a myriad of lights on in the instrument cluster, but right now, let's focus on the message that says service. BMW rolled out CBS on the 2003 7 Series, and since 2006, it's been standard on every car they build. What CBS allows us to do is dynamically monitor all the different serviceables like spark plugs and engine oil and air filters, and instead of just replacing those parts based off of mileage and time, the car monitors things like how it's treated during cold engine starts and warm-ups and how many revolutions the engine has turned and can dynamically adjust when services should be performed. There are even algorithms to calculate brake wear. The CBS is pretty clean on our car, other than engine oil. So, an engine oil change it'll get. Now, not all of these have iDrive, and if you're in one that doesn't, you can still access the CBS menu through the instrument cluster. The process of resetting CBS is simple enough. Switch on the ignition, Press and hold the trip odometer reset button for 10 seconds, then press and hold the BC button until it resets. Alternatively, you can use a scan tool. So Brad just finished up painting these brake calipers. Next thing on the list is an oil change. Even though this car makes super car-like horsepower, it's actually no harder to maintain than like a 335 or 328. To begin, remove the oil filler cap, followed by the oil filter housing. Don't remove the housing completely, just loosen it enough to let it start draining. Due to the design of this engine, there are two drain plugs, one here and one here. It's a uniquely designed sump, so make sure you drain it out of both sides. BMW recommends draining the oil out of this car for one entire hour. So while you're waiting, go ahead and check your tire pressures and have a quick look around the car for any signs of leaks or damage. Once the oil stopped dripping, install the new washers, then reinstall the drain plugs. With the drain plug snugged up, take a quick second and just clean up any residual oil. With the car back on the ground, replace the oil filter. Don't forget to replace the oil filter ceiling ring as well. Snug the oil filter housing back up and add engine oil. The BMW M division requires you use a 10W60 engine oil in this engine. With the engine full of oil, start the car and let it run for a minute. Finally, check the coolant levels. Check for any leaks. And top up the washer fluid. RM3 has a bit of a notchy shifting transmission. So to try to resolve that, we're simply going to change the fluid. We simply remove the four 10mm fasteners and the five eight millimeter fasteners. 
to get the transmission cover out of the way. Quick tip, remove the fill plug first in case it's stripped or stuck or won't come out. You don't end up with a transmission that's out of fluid and no way to fill it again. We already removed the fill plug. So now we'll take out the drain plug and let it drain. This fluid looks disgusting. And the smell, oh, simple things you notice right off the bat doing maintenance on a car like this. The drain plug that's made out of aluminum. BMW's M engineers have tried to save weight every way they can. It's the details like this that make me smile. Just like the engine oil, after it's done dripping, reinstall the drain plug, and let's fill this thing up. Snug up the drain plug, and fill the transmission with just over two liters of BMW approved fluid. You'll know it's full when fluid starts to drain out the side. Let it finish dripping, and reinstall the fill plug. Reinstall the transmission cover, and let's go investigate this rear differential. The diff in our car is a bit noisy, and it chatters too much when it's cold. So we're gonna try changing the fluid and seeing if we get an improvement. First, as with any gearbox, remove the fill plug. Keep in mind that limited slip differentials require a fluid with specially formulated friction modifiers. So whatever fluid you'd like to use, just make sure it meets spec. Side note, diff fluid is nasty stuff. So if you get any of this on your clothes or on your skin, you're gonna smell like a diff for days. With the drain plug still removed, pump a small amount of fluid through the diff. This will help flush out any lingering gear oil. Snug up the drain plug and start filling the diff. You'll know it's full when fluid starts to run out the side. Once it stops dripping, reinstall the fill plug and clean up your mess. I couldn't help but notice that our parking brake seemed a little loose. Hopefully it just needs an adjustment. <laughs> Once the wheel bolt's removed, you should be able to look inside the hole and find what we call the star wheel. Now the star wheel is the adjustment mechanism for the parking brake shoes. And all we have to do at this point is adjust the star wheel by turning it until the wheel just barely starts to drag. So basically what we've got going on here is inside this rotor, the parking brake shoes have too much slack. What we need to do is spin the star wheel adjuster which is the bit that adjusts the resting position of the parking brake shoes so that instead of the shoes having to move this far to the bite point, they only need to move just a little bit. Using a long, thin, flat-headed screwdriver, rotate the star wheel. And take extra care not to damage the wheels while you do it. With both sides adjusted, our parking brake feels great. And now it holds the car like it's supposed to. Now, we're going to do a couple minor enhancements to take a couple years off this timeless M3. First, we're going to plastic dip these black to make them look like the more contemporary F80 chassis. Then, we'll take care of some of the nastier battle scars. And lastly, we'll finish up with an update to the taillights. First, open up the hood so you can access the four Torx screws. And you'll need a Torx 20 screwdriver to tackle this job. So pull the kidney towards you and you'll see that it's attached by six clips. You'll have to release each of these clips and then just pull out the kidney. Now that you have the kidneys out, clean them and then find a piece of cardboard that you can put them on and give the kidneys two to three liberal coats with Plasti Dip spray. So while you're letting these guys dry, it's a great time to do some paint chip repair. We've used Dr. Color Chip with great results in the past, and so it's gonna be really exciting to see if this is up to the challenge with a tough color like Silverstone 2. First, 
dab paint next to the target, and then with one of your fingers, smooth it over so it coats the rock chip. Then after waiting 10 minutes, use their solution to get the paint off. And lastly, buff off any excess paint with a microfiber towel, and I think you'll be amazed with the results. Well, the kidneys are dry, the chip repair is done, so now all we have to do is put these back in. Installation is the exact opposite of removal. Mission accomplished. So the last thing to tackle is the tail lights. The reverse markers on this E90 are white and clear where the rest is red. So I went ahead and I picked up some of this transparent film to put over this clear area so that now the whole housing is red. I'm just gonna try to wedge this under here and kind of finagle it in there because it looks like it should be able to fit. Wait, what, what are you wedging where? Well, this, I was just gonna put it over the, the rear tail light. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, you wanna tint these with? Yeah, I wanna make it all one color, like, like the F80. Well, Brad, if you insist on putting film on these, we, we should at least remove them from the car, right? I mean, I thought I could just wedge it in. It looks like I got enough space. Yeah, you know what? Let's remove them. Since I wasn't gonna remove the tail lights, I put Trav to work. Trav uses a clip removal tool to remove all the clips and gain access to the taillight. He then removes one of the nuts in the room and gently pulls out the taillight. And here we go. Oh, awesome, thanks Trav. All right, so I think Trav was right. It's gonna be a lot easier to do this off the car. I need to grab Windex, I need to grab the tint, and I think we can start rocking and rolling. First, Grab your favorite can of window cleaner and thoroughly clean the lens. Then cut the film to the approximate size so it's easier to work with. And then remove the film from the protective sheet and apply it to the taillight. Use a razor to cut away the excess film and then tuck in the edges. If you see any bubbles, pop them with the razor and remove the air. Reinstall and admire your work. Aw yeah. Hey Trav. Look what just showed up in the mail. M stripes. Remember the compact gem that we had? Of course. So I was thinking we could probably put them like right here like everybody else. <laughs> I know. Remember when we put them on the last car? Yeah, on the side skirts. What if we did something else? Like what if we did here? How about here? I like this better because it's in the middle. It kind of brings everything together. Try it? Yeah, do it. The steering wheel is the first thing that sets the tone for any driving experience, and this one isn't up to par. As you can see, the soft touch paint has failed on our steering wheel, so we're going to take off the steering wheel trim. Remove the three T20 Torx bolts on the rear of the wheel using a T20 Torx bit. Tug firmly but carefully on the trim to pop it out. And use the T20 Torx bit to remove the trim from the right hand side buttons. And do the same for the left hand side buttons. To tackle this project, you need 80, 220, 600, and 1200 grit sandpaper. Some tape, some paint, and some plastic primer. Now that we got the steering wheel trim out of the car, first step is to mask off the M badge. Can't lose that. Apply two to three layers of tape to make sure you don't damage the M badge while you're sanding. Start with 80 grit, then 220 to get rid of all the soft touch paint. All right, so now that we're done sanding, you're gonna wanna wipe off the steering wheel trim and then hit it with some primer. Two coats will do, waiting about 10 minutes in between. Once the second coat is fully dried, use the 600 and then 1200 grit sandpaper to smooth out the surface. Wipe it off, and then you're ready for paint. Big improvement. So screw in the T20 Torx bolts, clip in the trim, and you're done. We've come an incredibly long way with our M3 from where we started. Finally, all the mechanical repairs, Maintenance and visual upgrades we've done are starting to come together. The last thing our M3 really needed to truly shine was a proper, proper detail. And after all that work, 
Here is the result. We finally finished our first ideal car. We did it. This car is so much more sorted than it was. Having this car properly dialed in makes so much difference. Yeah, it doesn't sound like there's a whine from the back anymore. The whine is gone, the transmission shifts as it should, and the power, <laughs> it Holy finally crap. drives like an M car should. So it's a nine year old car, and so there are some bumps and bruises such as dings from 90,000 miles worth of road service that we were able to touch up. We were able to update it also with the kidneys and the rear tails, which I think are awesome. I think they look amazing. I had my doubts, but I you think- You always I, doubt me I, though. I think we pulled it off. I think it looks really good. You know, I've never been able to experience such an amazingly well-engineered V8. Yeah. And with the eight individual throttle bodies, something I had never seen before, I really appreciate what they were able to do at the M Motorsports division. BMW engineered this thing to with an, an inch within its life. Yeah. I mean, the technology in this engine was was unparalleled at the time. And yet it's daily drivable. 100%. driver's car well you know Trav we found this car and there was a couple things wrong with it one that you didn't even know which was the throttle control actuator which was throwing an engine code and the TPM was on but I think we turned this thing into a top runner you know Brad I think we turned this little M into an ideal car all right man pull over pull, pull over dude what's wrong pull, just pull over I, I want to drive <laughs> All right, Trav, M button pushed on and... Yeah. <laughs> How amazing is that? I love sitting in this seat in this M3. This S65 is unlike anything else oh out there. Oh my gosh, with these new tires, this thing really <laughs> is just dancing through these curves. I mean, it really... Oh my gosh. This is kind of it, right? Do cars get much better than this? I... Don't know. The way this thing just downshifts, man, this transmission now, these things used to just grind into gear and it is so smooth. Whew. Okay, I think I'm done driving. Well, I'll have a go again. So, all things must come to an end and this carnival ride is just about over. The last M Motorsports car that we had on this lift was an E46 ZCP M3. The last car in this episode, obviously, was the E90 M3, which wasn't a competition package. Trav, do you think that the competition package is worth it? I don't think so, man. I mean, yeah. all it gives you is 10 millimeter lower ride height. Yeah. It gives you modified EDC and DSC, and it gives you those cool looking wheels, which but you can do all that yourself. And, you know, we got reps for our E46 CCP, and we lowered it with suspension anyway, so it was like a moot point that we got it. Right. Now, the fact that comp package M3s actually bring a premium of about $1,500 on the used market just isn't worth it. You can easily do that for less money with aftermarket parts. All right, so Brad, how, how do we value our M3? Yeah, well, I never thought you'd ask, but essentially, we had a car that we bought from the original owner, his son actually. The car is a four door and a six speed, which is kind of a unicorn when it also comes in an M only color, which is Silverstone too. And so the fact that the car had all maintenance done at the dealership and it wasn't a one owner car really brings up the value, I'd say about 20% over other cars. On top of that, when you find a clean four door six speed, you gotta snap it. We bought a car that needed some work 
But the Carfax checked out. I mean, and it had all its service records. Yeah, it did. So when you're buying one of these cars, try to find one that has all its service records. I mean, ours was a one owner car, right. totally clean Carfax. You know, like with an M3, there's no such thing as a cheap one. No. You're, you're either gonna pay for it up front, or you can buy you can buy what seems like a good deal and then pay for it in, in the repairs and maintenance later. And it's it's not that they're really difficult to work on or anything, but parts aren't cheap. They are, and it's 80% different than a regular three series. So you know that you're buying M specific parts for that car. So our M3 is a 2008 four door six speed. It is. But our ideal M3 would be an 09 or newer right. four-door six-speed. Because you get those awesome LED taillights, the updated taillights. It makes the car look so much more modern. Right. We definitely want either Fox red interior or black, which ours has, a four-door, and either a Silverstone 2 or mineral white. What a clutch color. Yeah, white would be cool. Would be our ideal car. The one that I think if you bought right, you wouldn't lose much money or even make money driving that car. Right, and they continue to do updates over the years. I mean, eventually they got an updated iDrive, they got they got several other revisions to the car as time went on, but anything 09 or newer is, is gonna be the one to have. Those taillights, man, I mean, they, no make, changes the car. they make the car look, look relatively current. You know, ours are kinda, well, but we tried the mod and it looked pretty good, I thought. I think they look great. All right, I'm going out on a limb. I think the E90 M3 Trav, is the best looking sports sedan on the market. Checkmate. I wasn't the only person that thought the E90 M3 is the best looking sports sedan with its perfectly sculpted fenders and its masculine power bulge because there wasn't just one, two, but three interested parties in our E90 M3. But only one made an offer that we couldn't refuse. What a day. We just sold this beautiful M3 to Mike in California. We've had the car listed for about four days now and had a couple of entertaining offers, but no one that actually offered full price. Today is the day. We bought this car for $22,750, put a few thousand dollars into it, had the car for about two months and got to enjoy it and make about $5,000 on it. I would say that is an ideal car. Checkmate.